Good morning. Let me add my welcome to you. It's great to be here with you. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. We're in, continuing in our uh, series on the book of Revelation this morning. So if you've got your Bible, open it up to uh, that passage that was just read for us by T Tony and Joanna. So open up to Revelation chapter 14, and we'll start at verse 1. One of my favorite songs in the Hamilton musical is the one about George Washington looking for a right-hand man. And he says, outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. And so the lyrics obviously refer to a situation in the American Revolution, but they're also an apt description of the church as it's described in the book of Revelation. A fierce war is being waged against the followers of Jesus, and they are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned. The situation describing the church was described in grand symbolic terms in Revelation 12 and 13. In the first half of chapter 12, we saw the gospel told using these images of ancient astronomical signs, constellations. There was a woman in the sky, Virgo, combining in herself the figures of a virgin and a mother and a queen. And following the constellation through the sky was a dragon, probably a combination of the constellations Scorpio and Libra. And these signs in the sky were the sources of various pagan myths, and John takes them over to tell the story of the gospel. The woman is... Israel, the true Israel, in labor with a son, Jesus, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The dragon is Satan, who lies in wait to devour the son. But just in the same way as the solar sun rises before that dragon can ever catch Virgo, so too does, is the son, the son of God, uh, raised up snatched away uh, and evades the Satan's efforts to conquer him. And that's the big picture story that, that we see in the beginning of chapter 12. But then John tells his readers that this story comes down to earth. In the rest of chapter 12 and in chapter 13, we leave the realm of the constellations in the sky. The dragon, Satan, is cast down to the earth. And he's furious that the son of the woman has evaded his grasp. And so he wages war on what the text says is, are the other offspring of this woman. And these other offspring, in effect, are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, the church. They're described in chapter 12, verse 17 as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the way the dragon wages war, we saw, was by calling forth two beasts. One beast is from the sea, a Gentile beast, a Roman imperial beast. The other beast is from the land, a Jewish beast that cooperates with the Roman imperial beast in making war on the people of God. And these two beasts work together to advance Satan's agenda using a stick and a carrot. The stick is the threat of outright violence and persecution. The carrot is that if the people of God will at least compromise a little bit and take his mark, they'll be allowed to buy and sell, to enjoy peace and prosperity in the dragon's system. And so the church John writes to faces one of two options either compromise or be killed or persecuted. They could retain some worship of Jesus as long as they also participate in the imperial cult and don't challenge the mores of the society. Otherwise, they would be ostracized, perhaps even violently. They were surrounded by beasts who wanted to devour them either through force or through subtle deception and compromise. They were outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned. And while John is specifically telling us about the 
condition and the situation of the first century church. The dynamics he describes are perennial. The dragon continues to create beastly ecosystems or regimes that employ sticks and carrots in an effort to overcome the people of God. He wants to either destroy the church or domesticate it. We too are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned. But that brings us to our passage today, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 4. The passage is a vision of that dire earthly situation, but from another perspective, a heavenly perspective. The center and heart of the passage that we read this morning is in chapter 14, verse 12. It says, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. In other words, this vision that we're about to see is meant to show Christians that they have a right hand son of man and to tell them how they can therefore make an all out stand. The passage begins in chapter 14, verse 1 on Mount Zion. This is the only place in the entire book of Revelation that Mount Zion is mentioned. And Mount Zion in Jerusalem is not the Temple Mount. It is the fortress. It is the place from which Israel's wars were launched. And what we're given here as we see Jesus in the figure of the Lamb come down on the Mount of Zion is an image of how we as the church are to ride out into war against the dragon and the two beasts. So, how are we to wage war if we are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned? What is our strategy? And this text tells us it's threefold. We wage war through sanctity, through sacrifice, and through singing. Sanctity, sacrifice, and singing. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. First, let me pray. Gracious God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Let us hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In the name of Christ, amen. So first, sanctity. We prepare to wage war through sanctity. Our armor is a life of chastity, being set apart as priestly, holy people. We prepare for war through sanctity. When the heavenly vision opens up in verses 1 to 5, we see this lamb on the Mount of Zion, the military mountain, and it's Jesus, the lamb who was slain, and he will go forth to conquer those beasts. And with him, we see his army, It's the 144,000 martyrs, the fullness of those who give their lives in testimony to Jesus. We met them in book seven. And as we look at this part of the text, we're looking into the future. Notice that the 144,000, they are around the throne in heaven and they are singing a song that we can't learn yet. It's a song only the redeemed can sing apparently. We'll return to the singing, but for now, the point is that we're given a picture of the army that has already conquered. And as such, this army here is a template for us, an example for us to follow. We're supposed to clothe ourselves in the same armor as this army, and the armor they are clothed in is sanctity, priestly holiness, The description of the martyr army's armor is there in verses 4 and 5. And it's really fascinating. I unfortunately can't show you all the work here, but you can either read this as a list of four or five virtues, but you can also read it as a list of seven virtues. And if you read it as five, it has military overtones. Five is the number of military organization oftentimes. But if you read it as seven virtues, it has Levitical overtones, priestly overtones. And the point the text is making as it lays out these things about blamelessness and purity, 
is that as God's people, as an army, we are clothed in priestly attire. As God's people, our army is holiness, a holiness that is tangible in the things we do with our bodies. And central to this description is sexual purity. The martyrs are described as those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. In ancient Israel, the warriors who went out had to keep themselves from sexual relations during the time of war. Why? Well, because the priests had to keep themselves from sexual relations when they were on duty in the temple. And waging warfare under God's authority was analogous to priestly activity. Essential to that service is dedicating one's body and one's desires wholly and entirely to God. Well, wait a second. If this is talking at least in part about sex, is it saying sex is a bad thing? Is sex defiling? Are women defiling? Is it saying that we must be virgins to bear witness to Jesus? No, I don't think it's saying that at all. However, it is pointing us to the fact that sexual chastity appropriate to our state of life is essential to resistance against the dragon and the beast. See, if you look down at verse 8, you'll see that Babylon, who we'll later see is aligned with the beast, makes all the nations, quote, drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, or porneia, unquote. See, there's no way around it. Sex is central to worship within the dragon's beastly ecosystem. This was true in the Greco-Roman world, and it's true in our culture today. There are dogmas about sexual freedom that our culture demands us to assent to. There are all sorts of liturgical practices that habituate us into accepting these dogmas, ranging from the sexual catechesis that happens in high schools and in college dorm rooms, to the media's constant awakening and training of our desires, to the ubiquity of pornography. I read recently that fully 30% of the internet is pornography. We are a culture that increasingly celebrates or at the very least accepts all sorts of sexual expression outside of that which God has ordained. We are awash in casual sex, marital infidelity, and pornographic addiction. And it ruins families, it destroys bodies, and it seduces us away from worshiping God with our bodies. I think it's safe to say that the number one cause of apostasy, people leaving the Christian faith in our culture, is some... all is something to do with sex. They either leave the faith altogether or they find a church that makes no demands that they do anything different or believe anything different. And sex is just central to beastly worship of the world, to a creaturely worship. And it can sometimes feel like we can't get out of this ecosystem. It's difficult. It's excruciating. But the way out that is pointed to us, the way to priestly holiness, is a worship that does not center on sex, but a worship that decenters sex. Notice the eternal gospel that the angel proclaims in verses 6. And seven, it's an invitation to worship, not worship of the world and its bodies, but to worship the one who made the world and all of its bodies. Fear God and give him glory. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That is the gospel of worship that can free us, can decenter a worship that has sex as its at its center. And unless we are creating as a church an ecosystem of transcendent, soul-satisfying worship in our own lives 
and as a church, we will not be able to recognize sex as the good but limited gift it is. If we're to be a holy, priestly people, we need to become more spiritually erotic in connecting with the transcendent God, or else our bodily eros will consume us and we will consume others. We prepare for war through sexual sanctity. Our armor is a life of chastity. One of the beast's central weapons is to seduce us. And we must be holy, priestly people. Here's the second thing I want you to see, and we'll circle back to to all these things at the end. The second thing is we engage in warfare through sacrifice. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and for the sake of the world. We are to be doing war by being a Eucharistic sacrifice. In verses 6 to 11, there are three another angels. Then in verses 14 to 20, there's one like a son of man coming on the clouds. And this is the angel of the Lord or the angel that is the Lord. And then there are three more another angels. And because of the total number of seven, three plus one plus three, and the use of the word another so repetitively, we're supposed to see here the work of the Holy Spirit, another helper, as it's called in John's Gospel, as he's called in John's Gospel. And we're seeing here the work of the Holy Spirit in these announcements of the angels and the work of the angels through the saints on earth. In verses 6 through 11, the Spirit through the church proclaims the gospel that is both an invitation and a warning. That is part of the warfare. But then in verses 14 to 20, we see the Spirit making the church into a sacrifice. That is the other part of the warfare. Notice what happens in verses 14 to 20. If you can look them over as I talk. The work of the angels here isn't word, proclamational. It's sacrificial and sacramental. These three latter angels reap a harvest of grain in verses 15 and 16. And then they reap a harvest of grapes in verses 16 to 19. Grain and grapes bread and wine, the elements of the Lord's table, the Eucharistic sacrifice. The Lord of the harvest through the Spirit is harvesting the earth. And this harvest is good. He's taking the wheat to make something good with it. And he's taking the grapes to make something great with them, wine. And this harvest is the harvest of his church. But notice that while the harvest is good, it is also violent and bloody. The grain must be cut with a sickle. The grapes are thrown into a wine press and trampled down to make the wine. And, it's, and this wine press is outside of the city. It's a reference to Christ who was taken outside of the city to be crucified. What's being said here is that the faithful church itself is part of Christ's Eucharistic sacrifice. It is his body and blood being offered for the life of the world. You know, this is why communion, the the Eucharist, is so central to the worship of the church because through it, the church is united to the body of Jesus and sent out to be a Eucharistic, living and dying sacrifice for the world. And John, what John's doing here is he's showing us the war that the beast makes against the church, but from an even higher perspective. He's showing us that God is active even in the violence of the dragon and his beastly ecosystem. And he's, God is active in this to make his church a holy sacrifice that's given for the life of the world. Like the proclamation of the gospel of the first three angels, It's both an invitation and a warning to those under the beast's control. Those in the world can either partake of the church as the life-giving reality and body of Jesus, or they can continue to trample it, and the blood they spill will become the wine of God's wrath, which we'll see in chapter 16. 
As we've seen again and again throughout the book of Revelation, the blood of the martyrs really is the seed of the church. The people of God offer themselves, their words, their work, and their bodies in faithfulness to God. And part of what that means is offering themselves to and for the world. The church is to be a militant force of nonviolent resistance to the dragon's beastly work. The church is to be present in holiness and righteousness, proclaiming the internal gospel of the worship of the one true God, but doing so in such a way that it also lays down its life in love for those who would destroy it. I think some of us in the church today want truth without love. We want to witness to the truth, but without offering ourselves as a sacrifice. And some of us in the church want love without truth, to love the world in a way, but without standing up to it. But the real sacramental Eucharistic power of the church is when we have the courage to be both radically truthful and radically sacrificial and loving. As many of us will be gathering later this morning around Eucharistic tables, or as the case is here, picnic blankets, let me encourage you to reflect and to pray on what sort of empowerment you need from Jesus so as to be a holy, living sacrifice to him and given for the life of the world. Is it that you need empowerment specifically in the area of truth? Or is it that you need empowerment specifically in the area of self-giving love? We engage in warfare through sacrifice. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and for the sake of the world. We engage in our warfare against the beast by being a sacrifice. I've talked already this morning about sanctity, particularly in the area of Sexuality. I've talked about offering ourselves up in truth and love to be a sacrifice for the world. These are central to our warfare, but they are probably two of the areas that we struggle with the most. How are we to wage this warfare? How are we to do it? How are we to persist? And the text tells us an important part of that answer is singing. So that brings us to the third and final point. We're sustained in this warfare through singing. It's through song that we endure in sanctity and sacrifice. Singing. You know, this passage is a cohesive unit, and it's bookended by singing. And again, in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 14, we see the into the future, the redeemed army of martyrs, And they're singing a song, but we're told that we can't yet know the content of that song. But then, in chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, we are told, we're let in at the end on what is the content of the song. And we're told it's the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, a song about God's great deeds, his ultimate victory over the dragon and the beast. It's the victory song that Moses sang after the deliverance from Pharaoh and his armies, and it comes to its fulfillment as God's people are delivered from the beasts by the Lamb. And if we're to be set free from the beast's strongest enticements in our lives, with, which often have to do with sex, if we're to empower, be empowered to have the courage to be sacrifices in truth and love, one of the greatest weapons we have is music, singing. In the Bible, God is a God of music. Zephaniah 3 tells us that God sings over his people. And we're made in his image. And in the power of song, we tap into immense power, the power of God. And C.S. Lewis perhaps knew what he was talking about when in The Magician's Nephew, he had Aslan sing the world into being, to sing Narnia into existence. I think Jonathan Edwards knew what he was talking about. One of his central theological insights was to see beauty as God's most supreme attribute. 
And he said that the main way creatures participate in God's beauty is to enjoy music, that it is music itself is the way God, or a way God shares his eternal beauty with us. Edwards calls God the most supreme harmony of all. And as Edwards tries to imagine the eternal kingdom of God, he says, when I would form in my mind an idea of a society in the highest degree happy, I think of them as expressing their love, their joy, and the inward concord and harmony and spiritual beauty of their souls by sweetly singing to each other. In other words, it's in singing as worship that we experience heavenly realities in such a way that we're empowered for holy living and training of ourselves as living sacrifices. We celebrate the victory before it's even won and we're sustained in the battle. Music and war always go together in the Bible and in human history. And if we are to successfully fight against the beast and his attempts to form us through his ecosystem, one of our greatest weapons is song. Singing channels our desire, our eros, to God. It tells us of our victory even as we face opposition. It takes these truths of the gospel and puts them deep into our hearts. You know, one of the greatest difficulties of this present season is the fact that we can't gather regularly to sing in worship every Sunday. And this is a real spiritual threat. And it's all the more important then that we double down on our commitment to worship through song at home as you watch church, but also throughout your day. Incorporate sung worship into your morning prayer and reading of scripture. And watch how that time comes alive. Sing with your kids, sing with your spouse, Sing with your roommate. Sing, sing, sing. This is essential to fighting this battle that we're in. Will you stand now and sing with me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.